Welcome back. Next up is lubrication. The, the main idea for lubrication in terms of helping our engine to not wear out is that we design the engine so that we can put a film of oil between each of the parts so that this engine is running, things are spinning and moving back and forth, but they're never actually touching one another when they do that. Uh, and uh, and theoretically that's the way it works. Once the engine is, is up and running and an oil pressure is established, the parts really shouldn't touch each other. Um, but, it, uh, uh, but it has other functions as well. So that's its main function. Reduce friction, cushion parts um, as they vibrate. Um, it, it dampens out the vibration, keeps them from slapping against one another. It absorbs some of the heat. Um, the uh, the FAA test questions often uh, ask a question about uh, the role of oil in in cooling internal parts, uh, and and that's that uh, that is very true. That oil plays a really key part in that uh, for parts that are not exposed to the flow of cooling air um, on the engine. It's especially important. Um, it seals the piston up within the cylinder so that the expanding gases just don't slip. Uh, down the side of the uh, cylinder past the piston. Um, cleans uh, the inside of the engine. Modern oils um, have detergents in them that keep everything uh, nice and clean. Uh, and we also use it as a hydraulic fluid to control propellers and waste gates and things like that. Um, it makes a handy source of, of warm hydraulic fluid. Oil viscosity is a description of how thick the oil is or how thin. Um, we use a slightly different numbering system than the commercial one uh, and for the grades that we typically use um, it's exactly double so an SAE 40 weight is a an aviation W80 um, com a, uh, an SAE 50 is equivalent to an aviation W100 and those are the two single viscosity oils that you're most likely to run into out there um, however, um, the SAE number is also printed right on the bottle in most cases. High viscosity oil means the oil is thick. So the higher the number, the thicker the oil. Um, something to keep in mind is that oil gets thinner as it gets hotter. And so if we have warm weather out or we're going to be operating the engine really hard so that it gets hotter, we need a thicker oil or a higher viscosity oil uh, so that when you're up to, to operating temperature, it still has, it's still thick enough uh, to provide that cushion between parts. Multi-viscosity oils are oils that are chemically designed to to cover a wider range of temperatures. So, for instance, uh, in a in in this example of an SAE 1550, um, what they're saying there is, during really cold temperatures, this oil is as thin as 15 weight, and as when it's really hot out, it's as thick as 50 weight, and uh, uh, and therefore can be used in a in a broader range of of temperatures. Um, when there, when it's a multi-viscosity oil, it'll in every instance that I've seen, they just use the SAE number rather than the um, aviation W number. So they wouldn't call it an aviation uh, 30-100. Um, it, it's always SAE 1550 or or something along those lines. There are a number of types of oil. Um, the most basic is mineral oil, um, and it and it's stripped of all of its uh, dispersant qualities, so all of its detergent um, chemicals in it, and it's only used for break in it. Basically, we want an oil that is going to retain all the little metal bits in it for a short period of time in order to break in the side of the cylinder. Um, it's not very heat resistant though, so we only use it during break in. Uh, we'll talk more about break in here in a little bit. Um, ashless dispersant is um, essentially a detergent oil, and these are this is most common. These are really good performance. Does a good job of keeping the inside of the uh, engine clean, um, and this is true of, uh, of modern automotive oils as well. Um, they're keeping the inside of your engine just clean, just fine. Uh, if if they if you go to Jiffy Lube or Oil Can Henry's or whatever, and they try and sell you a 
crankcase flush, um, tell them no thank you uh, because modern oils have been keeping your engine clean inside just fine. Um, synthetic, um, we don't use that in aviation recip engines very much yet. In the first place, it's very um, expensive. In the second place, it's not really approved for the engine. And in the third place, our seals may not uh, uh, be compatible with them. So the, the rubber seals around the front of the crankshaft and various other places may degrade if you use a synthetic. So we typically use ashless dispersant oils in our, our engines. This is a diagram of a typical oil pump um, system. And uh, this also represents, by the way, pretty much any other pump system. So hydraulic pump, fuel pump, they all have these basic same components or something really similar to it. Um, we start off here with a supply of oil and it's under lower random pressure um, and it goes through a gear pump. The thing you have to remember about the gear pump is that it it moves the oil around the outside of each gear, not through between the two gears. That would break the gears if it tried to do that. And so notice the direction of these gears is indicated by the red arrows. Um, they're spinning in that direction to move oil in the little pockets between the gear teeth and the case housing from one side of the pump to the other. That's an important piece to remember because some diagrams don't tell you um, they just show the little arrows of which way the gear is spinning and you have to know how that works. Um, next up in the normal flow of oil um, is the oil filter in, in its housing and the oil goes in and, fil and filters from the outside through a screen to the inside and then moves up and opens up a check valve um, after which it goes up and into the engine um, where it flows down through various ports and channels to where it's needed for lubrication. Um, now, uh, under normal circumstances, the oil pump is quite capable of producing more volume than the engine can take because um, the engine has all these restrictions in it and it's not just gushing through there, it's got to force its way through these little channels. And so any extra oil gets bypassed through the relief valve um, which is set at the maximum uh, pressure for the engine. Uh, and then it just gets recycled back through. Um, it's also possible though for the oil filter to become clogged with debris, in which case this bypass valve will open. And the bypass valve will supply dirty oil up into the engine because the th theory being that a dirty oil is better than no oil at all. Um, and, uh, and that'll open up. Unfortunately, you will not have a way of knowing that that's happened as a pilot um, the, uh, of small aircraft. Larger aircraft where the engine is worth a lot more money, they actually provide a light in the cockpit that says the bypass valve has been tripped um, and you're running dirty oil now. Um, but uh, in our small aircraft, you really all you have is pressure and temperature to watch. Some aircraft use an oil filter instead of an oil screen and the filter is a paper filter just like you have in your car and they're much more effective than a screen. Um, in fact, um, it'll make the difference between be, have, being forced to change the oil every 25 hours with a screen um, or 50 hours if you have a filter. Uh, and, and when we change the oil, a mechanic will actually take a can opener, a special can opener, and open that, that filter up and stretch the paper out and inspect the paper to see what kind of particles are accumulating there. Um, they'll run a little magnet through to see if they're, they're uh, ferrous uh, and, and that indicates to them whether a bearing is going out or, or what type of bearing. Uh, and that type of thing. So so it's not just a straight up oil change like you might do in your uh, garage for your car. Oil pressure. Pressure is the result of restriction and viscosity. So we provide a certain volume of oil from the pump and um, if you kind of picture if, if, if the pump were just going straight out an open pipe there would be very little pressure in that pipe. But when you, when you route the pipe into an engine oil system, there's all sorts of restrictions and so pressure builds up. And that's what we see in the cockpit in our oil pressure gauge. 
Um, so the more restrictions, the more pressure we have. Uh, with higher viscosity, thicker oil, um, you could have less restrictions but still have higher pressure because it's harder to force the oil through the restrictions. Um, high oil pressure indication can mean a couple of things. Um, the most common is that your oil is not warmed up yet. Um, it's quite common on a cold day to start the engine up and have the oil pressure read well above the green arc. Um, uh, the key is to just be patient, um, give it at least a five minute warm up, uh, and, uh, and that should be enough to get the oil temperature up and then the pressure will come down into the top of the green arc. Um, but the other thing that could be happening is the uh, relief valve is stuck and, uh, and, and if that's the case, if the engine is warmed up and, and now you still have a high oil pressure, then that's, that's a problem because you could blow out seals eventually with that, so that needs to be looked at. Low oil pressure uh, could be the opposite. The oil is really hot and therefore low viscosity. Um, it also could be the pump output is low, either the, because the pump is not working properly or you're just at an idle. Um, I've had lots of students go out to the run-up area on one of their first solo flights and of course they're nervous and looking at everything really careful. And they do their run-up and the engine's all nice and warm and it's after their run-up and they look down and they see that the oil pressure is, is below the green arc and so they come back to the ramp. Well, if they had just brought the RPM back up to the run-up RPM, um, then it would have been fine. It probably would have come right back up into the green arc. It's it's at that 1700 RPM or whatever your run-up RPM is and above, you should be in the green arc. And then the other thing could be that the engine is worn out. Something inside the engine has, has given way and so too much oil is passing through it. And so if if you're up to engine speed and the and the oil pressure is low, it could be that you've got an engine that is is getting ready to fail on you. So that's worth paying attention to. Um, it's worth noting that the oil uh, level is not directly reflected by the oil pressure. The oil pressure really won't drop down until you're out of oil completely. Um, it will influence it slightly because if you have less oil then the oil tends to be hotter and hotter oil tends to run at a slightly lower pressure. But it's a slight thing unless you fly the same airplane day in and day out, you'd never notice it. Uh, but you will notice if you run out of oil, then the oil pressure will drop all the way down to zero and then you'd better be looking for a place to land. Uh, there's a troubleshooting tr uh, table in your um, uh, text and it's worth really kind of watch, looking through all that. There are only a few of these things that are a pilot thing though um, because uh, all again we have is when we're operating the aircraft we can't even see the outside of the aircraft so all we really have is our oil temp and oil pressure. Um, so here's a diagram of the outside of the oil system on a dry sump system and, and what we mean by dry sump is this is an engine that has a separate oil tank and that's where the engine the uh, oil is stored uh, and uh, f uh, and the oil is is brought to the engine through this purple uh, path here and it goes through an oil pressure pump um, and then pumped into the engine under high pressure and it runs through uh, the crankshaft and and the lifters and the push rods and the rocker arms and splashes all over in the place in there and and as it splashes and drains down back to the bottom of the crankcase it's picked up by the scavenge pump and run through an oil cooler and dumped back into the tank to be reused. Here's a diagram of some of the various places that the in, the uh, engine oil goes on along the way and, and you can see that it's going through each of the lifters, it's going through the uh, uh, the camshaft bearings, it's going through the crankshaft bearings, it's, it's going everywhere in there um, and, uh, and making sure that again that those moving parts never really touch. So it's important for you to know whether your aircraft has a wet sump or a dry sump. Most of the aircraft in our fleet are wet sump. And what wet sump means is that the sump or oil pan is attached directly to the bottom of the engine. A dry sump has a separate external 
uh, tank to hold the oil. In a wet sump, the reservoir is attached right under the crankcase. That tends to keep the oil warmer on low perfor performance engines, that's important. It's also integral to the engine, so it's really nice when you're doing an oil change because you, you pull the engine off there, you're pulling the oil and everything else with it. Um, so you don't have to worry about contaminated oil, contaminated oil going into your new engine. Um, there's only one pump on this one, which means it's, there's only half as much of a chance of a pump failing. Um, uh, on a dry sump, we have a separate reservoir um, that is easier to cool because it's away from the engine. A larger supply is easier that way. It's remote from the engine. It's adaptable or more easily adaptable to inverted flight, which is fine if you're into that sort of thing. Um, uh, it has two pumps. I didn't put a bullet point for this, but it has two pumps. It has the pressure pump and then a scavenger pump to take the oil from the bottom of the crankcase back up to the uh, uh, tank, um, which doubles your chances of a pump failure. Um, and uh, it's not like they're a backup for one another. They serve completely separate pur purposes, and they both have to be running. Um, the most important difference between these, though, is this last bullet point. If you have a dry sump aircraft, you have to check the oil level after it's been running, like within the past 10 or 15 minutes. And the reason for that is there's a tendency for the oil to run from the storage tank back down into the engine over a long period of time as it sits in the hangar. Um, so if you check the oil before you start it up, it's going to look like it's empty. Um, and so you had a bunch of oil and now you've actually got twice as much oil as the system will take and you end up blowing it out over the belly of the aircraft. Um, so you, with that type of an aircraft, either you have to have a system for recording the oil level after the flight or you have to start the engine up and run it for a couple of minutes um, and then shut it down and check the oil before you go. Um, oil testing is a way of monitoring the engine's health. That's one way of doing it, and it's it's done at the mechanic's discretion. You take a sample of the oil and you send it in. They run it through a spectral analysis machine uh, that shows what types of metals are suspended in the oil, and that gives the mechanic information about which of the bearings are that are wearing out. It's something that if you, you really have to commit to doing it, um, each oil change or every other oil change or something like that so that you can track trends over time. And it's not cheap, so, um, so people don't do it often on small aviation engines, but they do do it a lot on turbine engines. Compression checking is another uh, way to uh, gauge engine health, and, and we may run you through one of those. It allows us to test how leaky a cylinder is, um, and this is only sort of ancillary related to uh, uh, lubrication, but it does give us an idea of whether the rings are sealing inside of the cylinder and uh, whether the valves are sealing uh, in the cylinder head. This is a picture of a compression checker, and it's a differential pressure checker. Um, I'm not going to go into detail with it here in this video, but we may take the time in class um, to actually run a compression check on an engine uh, so you can see how that works. Another way to gauge engine health is with a static run-up. Um, and this works for fixed pitch airplanes only. Um, you go ahead and go to full power with the brakes locked, uh, leaned as specified in your pilot operating handbook, and then look uh, for the specified I RPM. I believe the range for the 152 is 2280 to 2360 if memory reserves. But uh, look that up in your in your POH and, and it'll tell you what to expect there. And if you're not getting that, then it could be you have a problem with the engine. It's not something we do on every run up, but if you're flying and you feel like, gosh, this thing just doesn't seem to be performing or climbing as well as usual, that might be a good thing to stop and do real quick and make sure that it's really performing to spec. Um, we also have our, our engine instruments. There's oil pressure, oil temperature. They need to be used together. So if I have low oil pressure, or let's say my, low, my oil pressure goes to zero, but my temperature is staying the same, then there's a good chance that the problem is just the oil pressure gauge has broken. And so I wouldn't necessarily want to put my airplane down in a field um, or helicopter uh, and, and with all the associated risks of that, um, 
uh, when it could be just a faulty gauge. On the other hand, if the oil pressure drops and the temperature starts increasing, that is an indicator that something may have gone wrong with your engine and you should really be looking for some place to land. And if there's not one really, you know, if there's not an airport handy, uh, you may want to consider an off-airport landing before the engine fails. Well, you still have the option for a go-around or at least a controlled approach. Cooling. So we burn a lot of fuel. Uh, we burn enough fuel in a 152 at cruise to boil 425 gallons of water per hour. I looked that up. Um, and so we're, we're releasing a lot of heat with that combustion. And uh, uh, and only about 25 or 30 percent of it is is converted into useful power, which is which I don't know about you, but the first time I heard that, um, I was just really disappointed. I mean, what a waste! You know, we're wasting 70 to 75 percent of the of the released energy from the fuel. Um, uh, even more uh, dismaying is the fact that 40 to 45 percent is just carried out with the exhaust, just blown overboard. Um, about another 5 to 10 percent is removed by the oil and specifically it's cooling the inside parts of the engine. And then the last 15 or 20 percent is removed by the fins. And that, that can only work um, if you've got air flowing over the engine, obviously. So we have cooling fins on the cylinders that increase the surface area of the cylinder so that when the air flows over the cylinder, it has more, more places where it touches the cylinder and can get heated up by the cylinder before it leaves the airplane. Uh, and that's, that's how it takes the heat away. Uh, cowling and baffles have to direct the air through the cooling fins. One of the slight inaccuracies of the uh, ERAU video that I had you watch is that they say that they, they simply say the air flows over the engine. It doesn't really flow over it. it, flo it it's forced to flow down between the fins. Uh, and that's really critical. Um, if the cowling or baffles are broken and, and allowing air to escape the engine compartment without going down through those fins, it can really have a surprising effect on your engine temperatures. Um, the flow of cooling air can be adjusted. Um, the biggest adjustment you can make is with airspeed. The faster you go, the more airflow you get. Now, obviously, this is an airplane thing only and not with helicopter. We have a big fan for the helicopter to produce the uh, cooling air. Um, we also on airplanes have cow flaps um, once you get up into more high performance airplanes and they're allowed, they're, they're there so that once you get up and at a cruise where you've got more cooling air than you really need, you can close the cow flaps and, and cut down on the cooling air a little bit. Um, augmenter tubes are another way of controlling the flow of air and I'll talk more about those here in just a second. So here's a diagram of how that airflow works. It comes in through those front big holes up there behind the propeller, goes up on top of the engine, and then it's blocked off. There's a dam back here called baffle, and there's baffles between each of the cylinders, and so it forces the air to go down through those fins and get warmed up and therefore carry away heat, and then it gets dumped out the bottom of uh, the engine uh, cowling. Um, so here's a picture that shows the fins and uh, notice there's fins all around the cylinder. There's even more fins up on the head where most of the heat is and there there's even more fins uh, around the exhaust uh, valve which is the, the hottest part of the engine. Here's the cow flaps that I mentioned. Um, when you move the cow flap lever in the cockpit it opens and closes the doors on the bottom of the uh, of the cowling and you're only going to see this on 172 RGs and up basically uh, so 182s, 206s, 210s and, and on up. Um, another way to do the same thing is with augmenter tubes and uh, with augmenter tubes we use the high velocity exhaust gases to draw in a bunch of cooling air with them uh, inside some bigger pipes and uh, and the nice thing about this is the, the the harder we're running the engine, the more exhaust we're producing, and therefore the more uh, cooling air we draw through the the engine compartment. And that's awesome because that that means we have sort of an automatic adjusting system. 
Unfortunately, it's it's not perfect. Um, it, it tends to allow a little bit too much cooling air through the compartment under low power applications, and so you have to be very careful with this type of of installation to not reduce the power too much, or you could shock cool the engine. Cylinder head temperatures. Um, sometimes we have a CHT probe that, that displays in the, the cockpit. It uses dissimilar metals that produce a voltage that varies with heat um, and uh, screws into the cylinder head so that we're getting actual cylinder head uh, temperature. And uh, it's important to know if you ever own an airplane with one of these that you shouldn't cut that wire because it's part of the system. It'll never work again if you cut that wire. All of that um, really goes into this. So the biggest drawback of air-cooled engines is that you can shock them. Um, if you get them really hot and then you bring the power back and point the aircraft downhill so you get a lot of cooling air, um, some parts will cool faster than others and that causes stress and you're going to crack. Mainly the cylinders and cylinder heads is what you're going to crack. You have control. The thing is to make easy power adjustments, um, especially during power reductions. Um, take airspeed into consideration. So if you do need to get down in a hurry, one better way to approach it is to reduce power and slow down and, and descend at a slower airspeed. Uh, use cow flaps appropriately, meaning close them if you're going to a lower power setting. Okay, that's it for now. Um, we will talk about all of this in more detail uh, when we are in class working together.